Right now I want to talk about um, an, an ancient lost civilization. Who doesn't love lost civilizations? I would start out by saying that historically, and that is for a couple of millennia at least, we have understood there to have been three ancient old world civilizations. By that I mean the original places where human beings settled in civilization we define in several ways. One, it involves domesticated animals, domesticated crops, it involves irrigation, a writing system, frequently it's organized government and organized uh, religion, but most especially it's the places where people first began to live in cities. Now all those other things like cultivated crops and domesticated animals were necessary in order for people to have sufficient food to be able to stay together in one place and not be nomadic herders, which is what had existed previously. But historically, we had understood there to be three ancient cultures. Probably the oldest one, according to most scholars, is the Mesopotamian culture, which is the north end of the Persian Gulf over to the Mediterranean Sea. It's called Mesopotamia because that word literally means the land between the rivers. It was between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The oldest cities we believe in the world, although there's some disagreement about that, would have been the cities of Eridu, Ur, and Uruk in those areas. Second to that, very close to it, is the culture, the ancient culture of Egypt. The Egyptians, uh, obviously shortly after Sumer, and the Sumerians had their own alphabet and writing, the cuneiform was the original, um, and then the Egyptians with hieroglyphics come along, and the thing about Egypt is they have the longest continuous history in the world, and so we know more about that. Much of the rest of history, especially in the ancient Near East, in this area we call the Middle East, was based upon our knowledge of Egyptian history, because the Egyptians, with a long continuous written history, would say, and on this occasion I defeated King Ashurbanipal of Assyria. Well, we knew exactly when that was in Egypt, so then we know how, when Ashurbanipal was. So the Egyptian history has been very important. The third great culture that we are aware of is in China. It's a little bit later than the others, according to most scholars, although there's disagreement about all this stuff. But the area between the, um, the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers, or the Huanghe and Yangtze rivers, would, would have been one of the ancient cultures. That's what we thought the ancient world looked like up until about 100 years ago. In fact, the story of how this was all discovered, and it, it, the discovery of this, the fourth, the Indus Valley Civilization in India, what is today uh, partially India, Pakistan, and the corner of Afghanistan, the discovery by the West was not made until the mid-1800s, early mid-1800s. Nothing was done in terms of excavations or exploration of these areas until the 1920s was when it started. We still don't know a lot about this culture, but we, um, we don't know, for instance, what they called themselves. We tend to call it the Indus Valley Civilization because like all of these, you may notice, Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. Uh, Egypt was along the Nile, the uh, area between the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers in China. And here, in this area, it is along the Indus River and the, the tributaries to the Indus River. It's hard for us, one of the things that, that's a challenge, is for us to be able to know very much about any culture that lacked one of the two sources for historical knowledge. There are two different ways we can know about the past. One is by what is written. The other is by what is found in terms of physical evidence, that is archaeological evidence. There are some cases, like the Vedic culture, which comes later in India, where we have an astonishing amount of written material and almost no archaeological evidence. In the case of the Indus uh, civilization, the Indus Valley civilization, we have an enormous amount of archaeological evidence and no writing to speak of. I'll address that a little bit later. But the story of how this region, uh, this ancient civilization was discovered is it's in, itself, it in itself is quite a story. A man who went by the name Charles Masson Masson was a fascinating character. He was British. He had joined the East India Company, which was a semi-private company. It was an arm of the British government that was involved in controlling India and this part of the world. I'm going to do a talk about the East India Companies later on. You'll learn about that. Well, he was a member of the East India Company, but in 1927, he and a friend of his decided they didn't like taking orders anymore, so they deserted. 
His name actually had been James Lewis, but the penalty for desertion from the East India Company, like from the British military, was death. So rather than face the death penalty, he changed his name, went by the name Charles Masson, and claimed to be an American. Well, he was still something of an adventurer, so he traveled north and west into the Punjab region, area of uh, India, which was not controlled by the British Army at that point. And as he traveled around there, he became uh, something of an amateur archaeologist. In fact, he found at least 50 different ancient Buddhist sites that he uncovered. He began to collect coins. He was known as as a coin collector, at one point, uh, when he, before he went back to England, he had collected over 47,000 coins. In his travels, in the, in the late 20s, he was traveling in the area in the northwestern part of India, and some local villagers there had a legend. They, in their town, or just outside their town, the, the old town of Harappa, it was called, there was a castle, at least the, the remains of a castle. And their story was that an old Raja, an old king who had lived there, had offended the gods. And the gods had destroyed his home and left the ruins. Well, this was like, like when you have visitors who come, you always take them to the local sites. Well, they would always take any visitors to see the ruins of this castle. They told uh, Masson, when he visited there, that these, these ruins were 25 miles long. Well, he went there and saw the ruins of an ancient brick city that no one previously had talked about, at least not in the West. He did a series of drawings, this is one of them, of what he saw when he was there. Later on, um, he had a fascinating history. He got um, a pardon for his desertion and then worked for British intelligence for a while, eventually moved back to, to England and wrote several books. One of the books that he wrote was called The Narrative of Various Journeys in Balakistan, Afghanistan, and the Punjab. And in it, he included some drawings and he described this massive brick walled fortress and city that he had seen there. Nobody had ever heard anything about that in England. So they come at that point, people started getting interested in it. We had several other explorers, first English explorers and then uh, and, and archaeologists, and then later Indian, come there to examine it. Unfortunately, by the time they got there, nothing like this existed. Because in the interim, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the British were actively involved in extending the Indian railway uh, lines. Because that's how they moved goods from place to place, and obviously they were there taking advantage of all of the extractive resources that they could get out of India. So in the process of building a 93 mile long rail line from Karachi to Lahore in modern Pakistan, they, um, they were having a problem. There's no stone around there. There was no gravel. As they're building this railway, they had to have something hard to make the rail beds. Well, the locals said, well, there's a whole lot of bricks right over here. They ended up knocking down virtually all of the walls of this 4,000 year old city and using the bricks for the railway line uh, that they laid the tracks over. So without realizing that they were 4,000 year old artifacts. So most of it, by the time other, ex other archeologists had gotten there, most of it wasn't standing anymore, but there were still a lot of artifacts. Um, in the 1880s, a, an English um, archeologist, and then again in the 1920s, an Indian archeologist started digging here and they discovered a lot of different things. One of the things they discovered was an astonishing, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, an astonishing water management system. They also discovered an uh, extraordinary number of seals, meaning uh, items that would, be, uh, would have been used. They were uh, glazed in ceramic, made out of clay. They didn't have stone back then. Everything was made out of clay. That's why it was a brick city. But they would use these seals to stamp uh, materials that they could then identify as theirs when they were trading. But, so Mason is the one who first saw this, reported it in a book, others started coming. To their astonishment, they began to discover, because their, the Indus Valley Civilization was trading with Mesopotamia, they discovered artifacts in Harappa, which was the name of the local town. This is sometimes called the Harappan Civilization, because the first town they found that, that uh, uh, Mason visited was called Harappa. Later on, uh, a, an Indian archaeologist identified another town called uh, Mohen, Mohen, uh, Mohenjaro, uh, 
Mohenjo Daro. I'll get it out in a minute. Mohenjo Daro. And Mohenjo Daro ended up being even a larger city, and they found some of the same kinds of seals and things there. Well, this is the area we're talking about. The, the brown area here, they have now demonstrated, is the, the size of the Indus Valley Civilization. The reason they know that, they have found over 1,500 villages and a number, five or six, significant cities, and they're still finding more. The last significant findings in the exploration of the Indus Valley Civilization were in 1999, and they're finding more stuff all the time. So this is the Indus River here, and then various tributaries of it. Um, this is Harappa, the first place it was identified. Down here, Mohenjo-Daro is the second city. They believe, in this area here, there are at least uh, four or five. There's a short in this thing <laughs> that is always doing that to me, sorry. I think I'm going that way. Nope. Do, 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 do. I think I am gonna have to dance. Yeah, okay. Um, Harappa, uh, uh, Megar, Mohenjo Daru, and then there was a port city of Lothal. As I say, they have strong evidence now that these people were trading with uh, areas of the Persian Gulf and also uh, in, in, in Mesopotamia and then also over into the Red Sea because they have found some of these same seals in those areas and they have found artifacts from those cultures here in the Indus Valley or Harappan um, civilization. All of these towns here, they found seals and various other kinds of artifacts that have indicated to them that they were all part of this one large civilization or culture. Now, the size of this makes it the largest of the ancient civilizations. Almost all of the towns were somewhere along one of the rivers or tributaries of the rivers. There are a few outliers from that but they believe that the connection was by water. They would, uh, many of these places were port uh, towns. They had port facilities that we've been able to identify since then, so that it may have looked something like this along the river. It's thought that the reason why this, in, uh, there's a lot we still don't know about this culture, obviously, as I've said. We don't know for sure where the people came from. How did they cluster in these cities? Now, there's as many as five million people that were part of the Indus Valley Civilization, according to the best scholarship. Some of the cities were 40,000, 50,000 people, uh, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. Now that doesn't sound like a whole lot to us, but that would have made them among the largest cities in the ancient world. And the uh, to, to have that kind of population, they had to have an active trade system, they had to have the ability to move wheat, they had massive urban planning, I'll talk about a few of these things, um, their baked bricks that they built things with sur have survived 4,000 years. Obviously, they knew something about how to build things. The things we still don't really understand about this culture is we don't know what their form of leadership is. We don't know what their religious system was. Now, I say those two things because the standard thing we look for in any ancient cultures archaeologically are palaces and temples, indications of who, somebody being in leadership and some religious practice. We have no indication of any palaces and no indication of any, any sites of religion in any of any of the Indus Valley area. Um, we also don't know where they came from. We believe that the people may have gathered here in these cities along the riverbanks from other areas, perhaps further north in Af Afghanistan and elsewhere to the north because of aridification, it's called. In other words, it got drier. It was much wetter in ancient times than it is now. Many of the places we, we go to now, like Oman, for instance, some of us were just in Oman, those who continued on from the last cruise, much of Oman used to be much, much greener, much wetter than it is now. It's believed that as this part of the world started getting drier, people started moving toward the rivers and then moving along the rivers, the Indus Valley River and its tributaries, and that that's what created the civilization. As that process continued, and this civilization began sometime, we believe, around 3300 BC, the mature period, as they call it, probably began around 2600 and ran to about 1900. And then we see a very distinct decline happening. From about 1900 on, the cities are not as well planned. We don't see as much evidence of trade. There's clear, uh, the cities are smaller. There are parts of them that fell into disrepair, according to archeological evidence. And so we believe that between 1900 and about 1500 BC, 
there was a period of decline and that we don't know why we think that that probably was because of further aridification further drying up in fact we do know that one of the major tributaries of the indus river that had indus civilization cities on it completely dried up and went away and the people had to abandon those cities because of that um, the usual reasons why civilizations would die out is one lack of water second that for some reason their crops started stopped growing um, you know there were either plant diseases or uh, again because of, of uh, arid conditions or, uh, natural disasters we have no indication of earthquakes or anything else in this area or military uh, conflict that somebody came in and conquered them and we one of the other weird things about this uh, this civilization is we have no indication of weapons or of any military activity almost all of the ancient cultures seem to specialize in having images of warriors and battle and victory we have no indication of that from the indus valley civilization there were for they were fortified cities in fact um harappa was three and a half miles in diameter i mean the, the outside wall and it was a, an enormous brick wall, a wall that was 40 feet thick at its base. When you build a brick wall, you have to prepare for the fact that it's not going to be very stable. So the base of the walls of Harappa were 40 feet thick and were, were intended to protect the town. But we don't know who they were protecting them from because we have no indication of any kind of military activity. So all of these are some of the things that we do not know about it. But we do know they were port towns. We do know that they traded extensively. Um, there probably were, the, I said that this was the largest of the ancient civilizations. It covered about uh, a quarter million square miles in total, that area that I showed you. Uh, 1,500 city, uh, 1,500 settlements, most of them smaller towns, but some large cities, about 5 million people total. So this was a very significant thing. Um, these are, these this one on top and this are representations of what the cities might have looked like we're amazed looking at this ancient city particularly because we don't have any indication of an organized political structure there was no king we have no evidence we do have an indication that there were wealthier people and less wealthy people because of the size of some of the homes that would be in different parts of town but the cities were were clear examples of urban planning they are made in, uh, they're set up along north, south, east, west grids, a clear grid. North, south are larger streets, which sometimes were as much as 30 feet wide. The east, west streets were lanes, much narrower, sometimes uh, nine feet wide. So at, in every one of the lanes, at the end of the lane, so that you have one in each of the sections of town, there were wells. So there was public water available. The grids were in clear 90 degree forms and all of them were built to very specific ratios. In fact, all of the bricks and everything else, I'm gonna talk about the weight system in a minute. The bricks were all, they had two sizes of bricks. Small bricks were used for homes, large bricks were used for public buildings, which they had quite a few of. The bricks are all in a one to two to four ratio, meaning the thickness of the brick to the width of the brick to the length of the brick were all like two inches by four inches by eight inches. Now, they didn't use inches, but you get the idea. The larger bricks would have been a multiple of that as well. The, the city blocks were in ratios similar to that. We find that over and over and over again that they had a very clear, now whether that was mandated by somebody in authority, which we don't know about, or whether it was just that that was the building custom that they had, they figured out that worked well, this is a long time prior to any of this kind of system in any other civilization that we're aware of. We don't see the level of sophistication in building and in waterworks and things until the Romans come along, 1500 to 2000 years later, depending upon when you want to count it. You sort of get, if you can see this image here, they had, in addition to the wells, they had water running to most of the houses. Not all of them, but most of them. They had running water in the houses. Um, most of the houses had bathroom facilities because they had both fresh water coming in and they had a drainage system that drained into pipes that were underneath the, the streets um, and carried off. They had drainage, um, uh, what am I trying to say, troughs 
along the sides of the roads, and everything was angled at very exact angles in order to feed those. They had roof drainage that would feed into the street so that it would reach that. Nothing like this was is seen for another 1,500 to 2,000 years. The fact that they had running water in houses is, as you can imagine, quite astonishing 4,000 years ago, and yet they did. Um, so the civilization, this is actually a photograph of one of them, uh, most of, because they were along rivers, most of the cities were elevated somewhat. They would create a platform, usually a brick. They used uh, baked brick anytime that there might be water involved. They sometimes used sun-dried brick as well, but baked brick were much more substantial. And you can imagine how substantial these bricks were, because 4,000 years later, the British Army used it to, to provide the bed for railway uh, trains. So they would build up the city, and then there would be higher levels yet, and the highest level would be the area of a, a kind of a centralized fortress area, but again, we had no evidence that they had any military activity. In most of the places now where there would have been the citadel, there have been religious um, structures built, particularly Buddhist stubas, they're called, um, which came much, much later, because Buddhism didn't come along till, till after the end of this civilization. But astonishing city planning, astonishing water control, a very exact measurement. We have we only have the first level of houses um, in ruins. The British knocked them down and used the rest of it for the railway station, the railway uh, lines. But there are clear staircases that still exist. So we know there were multiple level dwellings that people lived in. There were smaller dwellings which would tend to be one room or two rooms. They tended to be on the lanes, the cross streets, the east-west cross streets. On the north-south main streets, they would have the larger houses, and they would tend to be multiple kinds of rooms with a central courtyard. So either a collection of families or a large family that had more wealth. But apart from that, we see no indication in the Indus civilization of any kind of social stratification. We don't know what their social order was beyond you know, what I've already said. Um, so this is an example of what the houses might have looked like with central staircases. In order to keep dust down, they never had their, their doors or um, windows facing out on the main streets, but only on the side streets. This is a representation of what one of the smaller uh, single family dwellings might have looked like, one of the one room dwellings, where you had the sleeping facilities on one side. We actually have a couple very small examples of fabric of dyed cotton. So we knew they were raising or trading at least for cotton. We knew they had the ability to dye things. Um, so they were using fabric. They, we have a lot of ceramics. So we knew they were doing, uh, and, and their indications are they had potter's wheel. They had developed that technology, um, cooking facilities, etc. So this is what w the one room uh, houses would look like. They were very thick brick walls. So they tended to be cool in the hotter weather. They were well sealed from all indication. Again, they would take the, the, sun, the uh, baked brick and they would seal it with a ceramic seal, just like they made the seals that they, they uh, imprinted things with. This is an example of the seal. This is, um, we found more of the, we, I wasn't there, haven't been there yet, but I hope to. Um, the archeologists found <coughs> thousands of these seals that are made out of clay, beautifully carved, as you can see. You know, most of them have animal representations on them. Many of them are bulls or things that we recognize. Some of them appear to be mythical animals, unless maybe there really were unicorns back then, um, and rhinos and various other things. We also have um, an alphabet, or at least I'm, I'm, it's not an alphabet. It might be uh, logographic. In ancient languages, there are two kinds of ancient language. One is actually an alphabet system which represents sounds like what we have in English. You know, we have 26 letters and we com that represent sounds and we combine them to make words. The logographic uh, is much more like Chinese, for instance, where they have pictograms that, rep that actually visually represent things. This is much more, we believe, a pictographic language. Um, there is some discussion as to whether they had an actual language or not at all because most of the time on the seals, um, we don't have any written material. There's no mythology. There's no parchment or papyrus or anything like that. None of that has existed. Only these clay, sealed uh, ceramic and clay uh, seals. 
but usually they have four or five characters on them. We think, some, some scholars think these may have been like, um, uh, like a totem representation or something that would indicate the owner, since mostly these were used for business. They would use these to stamp goods. That's why we found them in, in Mesopotamia and other areas as well. Um, there are a lot, thousands of these. Elephant, a rhino, a dewlap bull. As you can see, they, we have a, a few symbols at the top. Um, here's an example of the civilization. This was on a seal where we have people cultivating crops and gathering up uh, crops. Animals being used in domestic service. Um, so we have various indications of what we would consider the marks of civilization there. But on these seals, we've never been able to we. No one has ever been able to translate these symbols. We don't have many of them. They've identified a little less than 400 of these seal characters overall. They've not been able to identify any sequence in them. We believe they were written right to left because on some of them, when you get over the left-hand side, they squeeze them in a little bit. You know how you've ever started making a sign and you get to the right and the right-hand letters have to be thinner because to fit? Well, the indication is they wrote right to left because the left-hand side is where you see the evidence of that. But um, we have, no one has ever been able to translate this because most times it happens in like five character sets. The longest we have is 26 characters. Um, even though we've been able to identify what the characters are, it's never been translated. Some scholars believe that it may not have been actually a language so much as just a commercial code, like a, you know, like a barcode, some, some way to identify whoever the owner of this was for the purpose of, of uh, commercial trading. But we don't know. We do have indications. This is an example of a, of a horned man in a lotus position, a meditation position. The Indus civilization ended up being, or uh, was the foundation. Later on in the same area, they developed the Vedic religion, which became the foundation of Hinduism. I'll mention that a little bit when I, this afternoon when I talk about Hinduism. But we have indications of yoga, um, and obviously surrounded by big cats and water buffaloes and various other creatures here. But we've never been able to translate that. Now this is not unique. There are other ancient languages that we have a lot more examples of we've never been able to translate. In the Minoan culture on Crete, they have a language called Linear A, and we have a lot more of it than we do of the Indus uh, characters. They've never been able to translate that. It was many, many, many years before they translated a language called Linear B, which was the Mycenaean language. And so we continue to have things in the ancient, from the ancient times that we're not able to translate. I mentioned the ratios. Virtually everything in this culture was built upon a very strict, even scientific ratio. These cubes have been found in a number of places in the ruins. They are weights that were used in trade, and they run on an exact ratio of weight. 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to 64. The 16th is the most commonly used, apparently, based upon where and the frequency that that's been found. But these would have been used with a scale to weigh out the value, you know, the weight of something and therefore the value of something. These same ratios were used in everything, in designing their city grid, in designing their bricks, in everything else. Interestingly enough, this same kind of uh, idea came down to modern times because until India in the 1950s, after gaining their independence from Britain, until they restructured their money system, there were 16 subunits to rupee because even as far back as the end of civilization, the 16th was the most commonly used fraction. Now, the, the weights of these don't match any weights we have today in terms of ounces or anything else, but they have found examples of this weight system much, much later in other parts of India because we believe that the, uh, once it began to collapse, the people from the Indus Valley civilization traveled to the south and the east into other parts of India, and we found evidence of that. We also, they were also a very artistic culture. This um, is called the Dancing Girl of Mohen, uh, Mohenjo-Daru. And when this was first discovered, the archeologists could not believe that a civilization that existed thousands of years before modern time, and in fact, a long time before Greek art comes along, could, could rep be representative in this way. This, you know, the stand, 
the, the fluidity, the very human kind of characteristic of it was unheard of in ancient cultures. In most ancient cultures, like Mesopotamian culture, they tended to draw what amounted to stick figures. And you don't see anything like that. This figure, which is called the priest king, although we have no indication that they had priests or kings, it was called the priest king, uh, seems to represent, based upon the fact that he has a very beautifully um, patterned fabric across one shoulder, um, he, we believe that indicates somebody in a role of leadership. They had, uh, as I said, very active uh, pottery, ceramics, various other kinds of things that we did not know and that came along as early as that, um, various kinds of jewelry. Now, I will mention that you see the swastika here. The swastika was an ancient Indian and Asian symbol which meant goodness. The fact that it got co-opted by the Nazis gives us a bad taste in our mouth whenever we see a swastika, but it's very common in ancient Asian cultures, particularly the pre-Hindu and Hindu cultures because it was a sign of goodness. In fact, the, the ancient peoples, and we believe maybe the people who founded the Indus River civilization, are called the Aryans, which in the ancient language means noble. It has nothing to do with the Aryan things that of the Nazis. You know, the Nazis have polluted a lot of those meanings for people. Um, we have a lot of toys. There are indications, obviously they had a wheel. The streets are designed so that they could take wheel traffic. We have carts. Uh, we have uh, what amounts to Barbie figures, you know, dolls and furniture for children to play with. Um, we have oxen that would lead the cars. Some of the oxen are articulated. Their heads would turn and various other things. So very sophisticated little toys. Other sculpture that some of which we believe may have been representative of fertility symbols because they're very simil similar to ancient fertility cults. And then a lot of jewelry. They were very... <laughs> refined in, so to speak, in their metallurgy capabilities. Copper, bronze, tin, nickel, various other metals. They worked with, they um, mixed them, they used them for creation of jewelry and practical tools and things of that sort. So a very sophisticated culture 4,000 years ago. They also were, as far as we know, the first people to use dice. They, they had games of chance. And their dice are exactly like our dice. There is no difference. These were found at uh, Mohenjo-daro. They also had a very ancient form of chess that they played. We have found the chess pieces and the board. So they had leisure time. And, and leisure time is another indication of civilization. It was not until people settled down, had reliable food sources and food storage. There are large granaries at Harappa and Mo Mohenjo-daro. We know that they stored food, and the granaries were very sophisticated in the way they were designed so that it allowed for ventilation so that the grain would not rot. Um, so a very sophisticated culture in that regard, and they had free time, a sign of civilization. This is an example of one of the waterways in uh, Mohenjo-daro where they were able to channel water. Um, this is another water feature. They had public baths. We believe the baths might have had a ritual uh, use where people would use them for ritual cleansing. Ritual cleansing then later on becomes a very important part of the Hindu faith, where to bathe in the Ganji and to pursue other uh, cleansing kind of ritual is very important to them. This um, is like 30, I think it's 38 feet long if I remember correctly. It's over eight feet deep. There is a shelf that goes around it, so if you didn't want to get in over your head, you could still walk down in there and walk around. We believe that, and it's, uh, the, the bricks are all sealed with a ceramic seal so that it would have been waterproof. There are wells, as I told you, at, in each of the sections of town so that that was, the well water was accessible for anyone who didn't have water um, leading into their house, which many did, and the houses had drains, as I said. Later on, various religious structures were built at these sites. Um, either Hindu religious structures or later on still after Ashoka, the great, um, the great king who spread Buddhism comes along where they built the uh, stupas. But you can see the sophistication of all of this stuff. Centuries, even millennia before we knew anybody had that kind of capability. Any questions? I'll leave that up there for now. Any questions about that? Yes? Just a clarification. You know, you show the Schwarz sticker uh, sign there. Yeah. It's going clockwise. But the other one, counterclockwise one, 
is used as a Buddhism symbol. Right. right. Buddhism uses a different direction. It, it, the, again, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism all came out of Hinduism. And so a lot of the symbolism that you will find in those, and even some of the, you know, some of the original religious practice came out of Hinduism originally. And Hinduism was based upon the Vedic writings that came in this region right after the Indus Valley Civilization. Yes? Ross, uh, as, as you uh, explained the technology that they developed was quite sophisticated, is there any evidence, given that the Europeans have been traded, is there any evidence that some of this technology got exported? So did they export the technology, since we have evidence that they traded in Mesopotamia and elsewhere? Uh, I'm not aware of any, but I would be surprised if there wasn't some transfer of technology, because this area, when we talk about the Silk Roads and Spice Road, which you know would have affected this area somewhat as well, that's later, but the, you know this would have been in part of those trade routes. Um, more important than the silk and the horses and the spices and things they traded was the culture, technology, religion, arts, etc. So I I wouldn't be surprised at all that some of this kind of technology would have been communicated to other regions of the world where they were trading as well. But I don't have any evidence of that. If there is evidence, I'm just not aware of it. Other questions? Yes, back in the back. Two questions. One is, what wealthy cities are in this area now? And secondly, where is the greatest center of knowledge of this civilization? So what other major cities are in this area now? And um, what was the reservoir of knowledge? What, what is the greatest center of knowledge? Is it a university or? You mean, where are they doing the work now? Yes. Um, well, there are a lot of people involved in this now. I'm not, I'm not aware of which one center that is especially, there is a combination of British and Indian archaeologists since the very first. The British investigated it because, because uh, Masson printed his books in England and got some people interested and they went and checked it out. Then later on, the English, uh, the British government hired some of their army uh, surveyors and archaeologists to check it out and so the British got involved. Later on, the um, India created an Indian archaeological society and they began to investigate it in the 1920s and so it's frequently been a combination of Indian and British. I am not sure um, where the central repository of the various kind of research is now. You can bet the British Museum is involved somewhere there, um, but I'm not aware of that. Um, other cities that are in this area, Lahore is just, just north of this, Karachi is on the south end of it. Beyond that, I'd have to look at a map. I, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. Yes? Is there any evidence of burial practices or human remains or any of the people's side of it? Any, uh, any evidence of burial practices or human remains or that human side of it? Not that I'm aware of. Now, Mohenjo-Daru, uh, the, even the names, Harappa, they named the, the Indus civilization city after a local town that was close by, the ones that first told Masson about the, the uh, place. Mohenjo-Daru means mound of the dead, but that was a name that was given to it much, much later. We have no idea that that was a name you know, that they used in, in their time. But I'm not aware of any remains of any kind that, that they had um, at that time. Various cultures uh, have various ways of dealing with the dead, and their way may have been something that did not involve allowing for, for remains, bones, and whatnot to, to stay. The, um, I'll talk about Zoroastrianism this afternoon, for instance. Uh, it's very ancient, out of Persia and then into India. They, pollution, purity and pollution are two huge things to them. They believe that a dead body pollutes, and so therefore you're not allowed to bury a dead body, or historically you were not allowed. So instead, the Towers of Silence, where if you go on the spiritual legacy, you'll see one in Mumbai, they would put the dead bodies on, on the top, and the vultures would eat them. And once all of the skin was gone, you know the bones would be uh, would be ground up, disposed of, and if they ever did have to bury anything, they would have to seal it with a limestone seal so that there was no pollution of the soil because the earth was considered holy. So different cultures have different ways, and they may have had a process that involved not leaving any remains that could be found. Yeah, too bad, because it's right. We find a lot of evidence from human remains. Any other questions? Is this fascinating to you all? Yeah. Why don't we just go? We'll just tell them, turn around, we'll go up the Indus River, we'll, we'll check it all out. As I say, one of the major tributaries to the Indus dried up, and we know that the city's there, and we think that may have been what happened to them. But there's still a number of things that we don't know for sure about this culture. 
Um, we, we still don't know where the people for sure came from. We're still not sure uh, how they developed such advanced technology or, and if they trans transferred it elsewhere. We don't know what their language was. We don't have written, we can't decipher their written language. We don't know what their social structure was, whether they had rulers or priests, what their religious beliefs were, and we don't know for sure where they went and why. We have indications of that because we have found some of what uh, the artifacts in areas that are south and east uh, in India. So we believe they may have migrated because of been drying out, but we don't know for sure. Um, fascinating place. Thank you all very much for your attention. We'll be back this afternoon to talk about Hinduism.